There are countless tales of maritime expeditions, which resulted in catastrophic injury, death, or the mysterious disappearances of those on board. Historical explorations are riddled with terrifying accounts that were recorded at the time, or understood decades, sometimes centuries later. The Franklin Expedition of 1845-48 to is considered to be one of the most shocking and curious sea journeys to have ever taken place, and is the topic of today's investigation. Led by Sir John Franklin, the purpose of the campaign was to locate the elusive Northwest Passage through the vast sea lines of Canada, and to document magnetic data in order to aid sailors with navigational support. However, the adventure culminated in what many consider to be the most disastrous polar exploration ever recorded, with all 129 crew members and officers of the HMS Erebus and HMS Terror dying under very strange circumstances. Not only was the vanishing of these warships mysterious in nature, the investigation, rescue missions and examination into their whereabouts would take a further 170 years to finally be solved. The British Navy dispatched numerous ships in a massive effort to hunt down the explorers, but these attempts were in vain, as only a few bodies and traces of information were found at the time. When the boats and bodies of the doomed expedition were finally found, the investigation opened up a terrifying discovery. So what exactly happened during the Franklin expedition? During those ill-fated three years? What was the official purpose and reason for venturing into such uncharted territory? And what fate awaited those brave souls who dared to battle the rough seas of Canada to find the Great Northwest Passage? Join us as we unpack the terror and attempt to solve the enigma that was the Franklin Expedition. Grab your map, compass and life jacket and let's go. Background As with any story, there is a beginning, middle and end. Therefore, we must go back to the beginning itself, before the HMS Erebus and Terra set sail, in order to ascertain the logic, reasoning and purpose of their journey. During the 15th and 16th centuries, Western explorers made various attempts at chartering a commercial sea route around the American land barrier that was originally experienced by the ultimate explorer and navigator, Christopher Columbus. The Northwest Passage was first verified and sought after ever since the Greco-Roman geographer, Ptolemy, identified the inlet, which was situated geographically between the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. The aim of businessmen, sailors, and their crew members was to establish a maritime trade lane between Europe and East Asia, and so the chase was on. Famed explorers such as Jacques Cartier, Sir Francis Drake, Sir Martin Frobisher, and Sir Humphrey Gilbert failed in their attempts at conquering the elements, the latter drowning during his own attempt in 1583. However, these tragic and disappointing expeditions assisted in gaining knowledge and assorting a navigational blueprint of the Arctic Passage and surrounding regions, thus providing future explorers a better chance of locating it. Franklin and the Expedition The expedition itself was extremely tempting to those interested, and was assumed to be a worthwhile venture, which had a high expectation of being successful. Step forward 59-year-old Captain Sir John Franklin Born April 16, 1786, in the market town of Pillsby, situated in Lincolnshire, England, the Admiral was well respected in maritime circles, having entered the Royal Navy at age 14. His voyage to Australia was significant, alongside Captain Matthew Flinders, the great British navigator and cartographer. Both men were able to circumnavigate the region, originally called New Holland, from 1801 to 1803. From there, Franklin would serve in the battles of Trafalgar and New Orleans before taking command of the Trent on Captain David Bushen's Arctic Expedition in 1818, in an attempt to reach the North Pole. Franklin would explore areas of the Arctic Ocean on several occasions between 1819 and 1827, before being knighted in 1829, 
and serving as governor of Van Diemen's Land, now Tasmania, from 1836 to 1843. It was safe to say that Captain Franklin was well equipped to command the expedition to the Northwest Passage. He was contacted by Second Secretary of the Admiralty, Sir John Barrow, in 1845 with the proposal. Barrow himself had an extensive resume and had been searching for the elusive passage for more than 40 years. Luckily for Franklin, the Secretary's experience in mapping the area was prosperous and crucial to the expedition, as well as the captain's decision to accept the proposal. Accompanied by senior officers, Francis Crozier and James Fitzjames, the men decided to take on the challenge. Ensuring that the ships were strengthened with additional layers of iron and wood within the bows and fitted with steam engines to support the heating and water systems, both vessels were seemingly prepared to cope with the harsh conditions. Pigs, hens, canned soup and vegetables were also packed within the structures of the Erebus and Terra to feed the crew for approximately three years with a further 32,000 pounds of preserved meat, 1,000 pounds of raisins, and 580 gallons of pickles on board. And so, on May 19, 1845, the HMS Erebus, commanded by Franklin, and HMS Terror, co-captained by Fitzjames and Crozier, set off from the River Thames towards the Orkney Islands in Scotland for their first excursion in search of the Northwest Passage. However, despite the beautiful scenery and determination to succeed in their mission, it wouldn't take long before things began to turn sour. Whilst docked in the large Western Bay area of Disco Bay in Greenland, the cabin crew wrote to their loved ones to update them on their travels. According to many, Franklin ran a very tight ship, banning excess consumption of alcohol and curse words amongst those on board. It was also revealed that he had immediately dismissed five of the sailors from continuing the journey the reasons for which were unclear. After two months of sailing, the warships crossed into the Canadian territory of Nunavut, where they passed through Baffin Island, the largest island in Canada and the fifth largest island in the world. It was during this passage into the waters of Lancaster Sound that the ships were seen for the very last time by a group of Europeans on a whaling expedition. The Vanishing After the sighting outside Nanavut, nothing was seen or heard from the crew of both ships for a further two years. In 1848, Sir John Franklin's second wife, Lady Jane Franklin, became so worried that something terrible had happened to her husband that she urged the British Navy to dispatch a search and rescue team to locate the men, or at least detect their last known whereabouts. More than 40 expeditions were appointed and commissioned by the Admiralty, becoming the largest naval search party to date, but only a few clues were found. Contaminated food cans, personalised artefacts and evidence of bone marrow suggested that something had certainly gone wrong and that the men were either in danger or more likely dead by that point. Lady Franklin wrote a letter for each mission requesting that they be handed to her husband when he was found. The desperation and anxiety would have been excruciating for the families and friends of the crew, something which is often overlooked. To put into context the scale of the quest for the Northwest Passage and subsequent rescue attempts is to understand that it is one of the world's harshest maritime pursuits. The route itself is located 500 miles north of the Arctic Circle and less than 1200 miles from the North Pole. The journey includes an array of deep channels through Canada's Arctic archipelago, which extends to approximately 900 miles from east to west. It's not the place you want to get lost in. Search and Evidence As the months and years followed, the hope of ever finding the men alive again soon evaporated as well as the likelihood of understanding what went wrong and what actually happened to them. Did they make it to the Northwest Passage? Were they deviated off course by the ruthless weather conditions? Or were they attacked and outnumbered by something far more sinister? 
Researchers have referenced an important artifact from the expedition, known simply as the Victory Point Note, which was dated April 25th, 1848, and written by Captains Crozier and Fitzjames. It was found in May 1859 by the Irish explorer Francis McClintock and his team, and was folded into a stone cairn on King William Island, which is part of the Arctic Archipelago in Canada. According to the note, the Franklin expedition spent the winter of 1845-46 on Beachley Island, before travelling down the Arctic waterway of Peel Sound. Just off King William Island, the Erebus and Terror became trapped in the ice, forcing the men to spend the winters of 1846-47 and 47-48 on the island. The second part of the note is dated the 25th of April 1848 and is transcribed as follows. During the attempts at finding the crew and salvaging the ships, rescue teams spoke to the Inuit people, a group of culturally and linguistically unique indigenous people of the Arctic and sub-Arctic regions. They told searchers that approximately 35 to 40 white men had died near the mouth of Back River. During the interviews, the Inuit spoke of the horrifying ordeals that befell the men of the Erebus and Terra. Malnutrition, madness, and cannibalism sparked outrage and resentment when relayed back to the government of Great Britain. And yet, search parties stumbled across historical, primitive campsites, as well as the graves of Franklin's sailors John Hartnell, John Torrington, and William Brain, all of which were dated 1846. In 1850, John Ray, a Scottish explorer, conferred with a group of Inuits during his quest across the Gulf of Boothia, he noted that the natives had accumulated a stock of possessions which seemingly belonged to the crew of the doomed expedition. When questioned, they directed him to a mass section of human remains. Shocked and horrified by his discovery, Ray noticed that many of the bones were broken in numerous places and displayed evidence of knife markings, suggesting that they may indeed have resorted to cannibalism to survive. He stated that from the mutilated state of many of the bodies, and the contents of the kettles, it is evident that our wretched countrymen had been driven to the last dread alternative as a means of sustaining life. In 1981, Canadian forensic professor of anthropology at the University of Alberta, Owen Beatty, founded the Franklin Expedition Forensic Anthropology Project. Having gained a specialized knowledge of human skeletal biology, Beatty has assisted the Royal Canadian Mounted Police and other agencies in criminal investigations and accidents. His expertise was paramount in understanding what happened during the Franklin expedition. The bodies of Hartnell, Brain, and Torrington were exhumed and analyzed in 1984, with Torrington's remains being examined thoroughly. It was clear that all three men showed signs of malnourishment, pneumonia, and high levels of lead in their system. Lead solder was used to seal the food tins and containers, which were lined with lead foil, food colouring, tobacco, tableware, and candles. Beatty concluded that this overexposure to the lead, as well as the effects of vitamin C deficiencies and scurvy, could have been the cause of death for many on board. The professor claimed that those responsible for tinning the 8,000 canned supplies had done so sloppily, and that lead likely dripped like melted candle wax down the inside surface therefore contaminating everything around and consumed by the crew. Despite skeptical outlooks on his findings, Beatty collaborated with writer John G. Geiger on a best-selling book titled Frozen in Time, The Fate of the Franklin Expedition, which became popular in Canada, the United Kingdom and Germany. You can pick up your copy in the description below. It's well worth a read. Aftermath 
Subsequent theories, tales and speculative analysis have been made on the Franklin expedition, many of which come to the same conclusive decision on the unfortunate circumstances that befell the crews. After the research was conducted on the bodies and bones of the crew members, the hunt was on to find the ships themselves. In 2014, Parks Canada, the agency of the Government of Canada, which manages the country's national parks, marine conservation areas, historical sites and urban parks, found the Erebus in 36 feet of water off King William Island. Two years later, the Terror was found by members of the Arctic Research Foundation in a bay of water in the Kitik Miot region, 45 miles away from an area called Terror Bay. An eerie coincidence, I'm sure you would agree. For conspiracy theorists, the fact that neither ship displayed any evidence of structural damage has sparked many to believe that something mysterious, or even otherworldly occurred, as both ships' hulls were found to be fully intact. It was also noted that all of the doors on the Terror were left wide open, all except for the captain's quarters. However, scholars dismiss paranormal intervention and believe that this is clear evidence that the men were forced to abandon their posts and that any attempt at tackling the overwhelming, icy territory would have been futile. Instead, Franklin and his men chose to survive on foot, but would ultimately perish due to the aforementioned afflictions and or brutal encounters with the native Inuit people. All artifacts and personalized items found throughout the search, rescue and salvage expeditions were transferred to the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich, London, in 1936, and are certainly worth a look. As for the ships, they remained dormant on the Arctic floor, where they met their dramatic end and plunged into the unforgiving waters. So what about the Northwest Passage itself? The sea lane was finally overcome in 1905 by a Norwegian explorer, Raoul Amundsen, who after setting sail in 1903, successfully navigated through the midsection of the trail and emanated with his team in the Beaufort Sea. Later in 1944, the first single-season transit was completed by Sergeant Henry A. Larson of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, who made the successful voyage on a schooner sailing vessel. Since then, boats ranging from smaller structures to cruise ships have traversed the Northwest Passage, with rising earth temperature reducing the amount of ice and providing a safer passage to those attempting to travel across it. For those who understand and appreciate the horrific events that occurred on the Franklin Expedition may have seen The Terror, an American supernatural horror drama television series developed for the AMC Network. Named after Dan Simmons' 2007 novel, the first season premiered on March 25, 2018, and it serves as a fictionalized account of the ill-fated journey. Conclusion It is clear that the Franklin expedition was a doomed venture, even before the ship set sail from the River Thames. If indeed the men aboard the HMS Erebus and HMS Terror suffered from food poisoning, harsh weather conditions, or perhaps met their fate in a terrifying battle of wills against the more experienced, well-prepared natives of the region, one can only imagine what they went through. It is often irreverent to speak of those souls who died on the voyage in terms of numbers, statistics, or as a collective label. Each man was an individual, a human, who set out to achieve greatness, but paid the ultimate cost. As mentioned earlier, the anxiety, heartache, and hardships faced by the women, children, and families of the sailors is equally, if not more frightening to have endured, especially during those years of receiving no word from their husbands and fathers. As we all continue to understand the world around us, we must always remember that Mother Nature is unforgiving, and when she is upset or angry, nothing can prepare you for what comes next. Did the crew resort to cannibalism in order to survive? I guess we'll never know for sure. However, it certainly poses us with the question, what would you do to survive? We hope you've enjoyed this investigation. Thanks for watching, take care, and we'll see you next time.